Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba. We are honored today to be joined by Sharon Miller, who is Artistic Director of Sharon Miller's Academy for the Performing Arts in Montclair, New Jersey, an icon, a leader in the world of the arts and humanities and dance, who has been doing it for a long time and making a difference for so many of so many ages. Sharon, you honor us by joining us. Oh, thank you. I'm honored to be here. It's such a thrill to be able to talk about what it is that's your passion, that's your life. And I guess dance and related theater arts has become and is my life. Mm. I mentioned before we get on the air that our daughter uh, started her dance career at uh, the Academy. And, and I remember peeking through. Sharon's at the studio, you get these little windows you got to peek through because they want us staying out of the room. You were that started. dad. I, I thought you're not supposed to look through those windows. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't want Sharon's team to catch me. I was trying to take video. They're like, get out of the way. Get out of there now. So you're laughing, Sharon, but it's true. But Sharon, for you and your colleagues at the Academy, the greatest reward, satisfaction, of knowing that you've influenced and impacted the lives of so many young men and women in the field of the arts. Talk about that. You know, we've been in business for 27 years and it's been 27 years of not work, but passion and play and joy. And I guess after 27 years, it was a first, I think a shock to me when one of my students, male African-American young man, who came to me as a sixth grader at the Renaissance School here in Montclair and said, I can dance. And I said, show me. And he could. It was just a gift. He is now, uh, I don't know exactly how old he is, but he is now a principal dancer with the Albanelli American Dance Theater. He is an associate professor of dance at NYU. And his name is Shalvar Montero. And he's- Say, say his name dance. again. Say his name again. Shalvar. Montero. Wow. So having those kinds of things happen as far as people going into the field, that's one thing. But now I have, which is sort of scary, I have students who come back and say, do you remember me? As they're holding a little four-year-old's hand and they're saying, this is my daughter. <laughs> and they say wow. to their daughter, Mommy had Miss Sharon as a teacher. And the, <laughs> I, I kind of now know I'm old, but I'm, no. as my mother used to say, I'm not cold. So No, you're not, not cold. It's, it's you're experienced. You're not old. And by the way, there's some, the noise going on is because there's always some construction going on out on the streets outside of uh, the academy. Mary, I want you to follow up here in just a second, but one more thing. Sharon, when did you know that dance would be such a huge part of your life? You know, it's ironic. I've heard the expression, turn lemons into lemonade. I had fallen arches as a child. And my mother took me to a doctor who said, you can either break her arches and reset them. And I was about three years old at the time. Or you can wait until she's about six or seven and give her ballet lessons, which will strengthen her feet and her legs. So obviously my mother opted for the, uh, the latter. Right. But... I got to dance class for the first time when I was six years old. I did my first plie to this beautiful music. And I was just smitten. And un unbelievably, the teacher went to my mother and said, she has talent. She needs to be in a more advanced school. So I went to Garden State Ballet as the first African-American dance student. And... The rest is history. I discovered modern dance at 12 and I said, I want to do that. You take the point shoes off and you're barefoot and you fly through the air. And I said, I want to be in Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And I got it. So I think seven was when I first knew. 12 was when I knew for sure what field of dance I wanted. And the rest of my life has been devoted to sharing that with young people. And now I'm my oldest student. Well, she says she's 98, but I'm not sure. I think she's older. <laughs> okay. God bless her. Youngest and oldest, Sharon. Youngest student, oldest student. Two. 
is the youngest. We have Dance With Me, which is a class that we have with, it's a mommy and me class. And the seniors uh, dance program is uh, Wednesdays at 10 o'clock. And Gilda Schwartz has been coming since we first started. And she, she says she's 98. She says, well, the last time I asked her, because I did want to ask her, she said, basically, a woman never tells. <laughs> I love it. By the way, we're, we're putting up the website for the Sharon Miller Academy, Sharon Miller's Academy for the Performing Arts. Uh, we'll talk in just a second about the challenges of running a not-for-profit and the economics of it, which, trust me, we understand as well. But Mary, <laughs> jump in. Yeah, well, that's exactly the direction I was going to go into, Sharon, because we talked about this offline when uh, we spoke before this interview today and talk mm -hmm. about some of the challenges and really what a nonprofit, especially three years now, I can't believe we're three years you know, into the pandemic. Uh, what do you need most as a nonprofit based on the challenges that you're facing? Basically, we need support, um, financial and otherwise. I think what happened during the pandemic is, again, turning your lemons into lemonade, we learned the word pivot. And pivot became a word that I honestly didn't like, but you figure out a way to survive. And it's, it's kind of like anyone who's facing a challenge. You can either wallow in the problem or you can become part of the solution. What we love doing seems so basically irrelevant vis-a-vis -vis what was going on in the world. But we also need that social and emotional touching of the spirit. Dance does that. And the thing that we learned how to do was wear a mask and put on the computer with Zoom and still keep on keeping on. Once the, the pandemic, well, I don't know that it's ever going to be over. Now it's something called an epidemic or something. It's not a pandemic anymore. But people are coming back and they're so happy to just be relating to each other, relating to music, relating to movement. It's, it's heartwarming. But what happened prior to it, we actually had to close I mean, that I saw my life going before my eyes, but we closed for about four months. Thank God the government came up with the, what they call PPP loans. And we, we were able to qualify for two of them. And because we are a not-for-profit and because we provide arts education to people with limited funds, if if not no funds whatsoever, we were able to turn our PPPs into grants. So we didn't have to pay that money back. We have support from such wonderful foundations like the Terrell Fund, the Dodd Foundation, Stone Foundation, um, Victoria Foundation, New Jersey State Council on the Arts. And they came to New Jersey, I've got to say, supports the arts. And we somehow came through relatively unscathed, except for rent. Now rent is, oh boy. Yeah, no one's gonna forgive your rent anytime <laughs> soon, are they, Sharon? No. And we had a difficult time because we have an enormous rent debt. Uh, not that we owe now, we don't owe now, but at the time, if you have no money really coming in and you don't know when the next amount is going to come in, the one thing that you sit on, which we were basically allowed to do, was paying the enormous rent. We have 9,000 square feet. Our rent, believe it or not, is $15,000 a month. Mm. And you can't make that with when you're not teaching. It's hard to make that even when you are teaching. So we had a we had a struggle in that our landlord really wanted his rent. And ultimately we took the money that we were hoping to hold to guarantee that we could still teach, we could still do our residencies in the school systems. 
and pay our, our salaries to our instructors, but we paid our landlord. And again, it's like the universe provides somehow when you're doing good work, I think. I've come to terms with that. Somehow we were able to pay our landlord and we were able to get even more grants, more support from our families, and we're thriving now. I, I can't believe it. Well, Sharon, a lot of that is based on your leadership, and that's why we wanted to do this as a lessons in leadership segment, but also air it on our public television side because it has multiple uh, purposes, this conversation. You are a leader. You're an innovator. You have a level of grit, one of my favorite words that I you don't see in many people, and your compassion, your empathy, your caring, particularly for young people and giving them a pathway into the arts, whether they pursue it professionally or not, but a foundation for the rest of their lives is extraordinary. So on behalf of all the parents who have had children, grandchildren, others who have gone through the academy, I just want to thank you for your work and you have an open invitation with us, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I hope to keep doing it until they tell me stop. Mary, that's why I say refire. Don't mm -hmm. retire because yeah. <laughs> Sharon Miller is refiring every day. Sharon Miller, uh, thanks so much. And that's Mary Gamba. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, resourcing the world, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com. NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Media, a print and digital business news network. We are honored to be joined by our longtime friend, Dr. Lamont Repolette, president of Kane University, the former head of the Department of Education in the great state of New Jersey. Good to see you, doctor. Good to see you, Steve. How's it going? Things are great. I, I got to tell you, I, I was in your office a couple months ago. It is an extraordinary office. Um, is that when you moved in as president, is that just the way it was or you do anything with it? Yes, the way it was. It was renovated by um, maybe about 15 years ago. And you might know her, the name Ann Estabrook. She donated some money. Ann Estabrook donated. She's definitely a friend of Kane, uh, very philanthropic. She's one of our best donors. And she really renovated the space. And it's original. It's an extraordinary uh, university and an office there. Uh, Lamont, let me just jump right in. You and I, when we were together, we talked a lot about leadership and developing people and coaching, et cetera, et cetera. And P.S., uh, Dr. Replet was on his way when I was with him. He was getting on a plane. He was going to see a game. I think it was, who were you going to see? Do you remember? See Deion Sanders in Atlanta. Yeah, so I just wanted to get a plug for Deion Sanders, yes. <laughs> uh, a great coach. Hey, listen. Your, your approach to leadership, we talked about this privately, I want you to share it publicly. The greatest, most significant influence on you in terms of your leadership style comes from what or and or whom? I guess it comes from, from my family, my parents, really originated from understanding that kindness and humanity is the key, right? And my family, my family didn't have a lot of money, but they had a lot of love. And they took in folks when they shouldn't have taken in folks. They fed folks when they couldn't feed themselves. And it started with my grandmother, the matriarch of the family, and then the rest of my mother and my mother and father. So I'm thankful. So at the core of who I am is really about people. I have this saying, Steve, is that, you know, and it's not my saying, it's, it's a quote, I'm not quite sure who said it, but it's people are the greatest asset in any organization. And mm -hmm. I think once we understand that people are the greatest asset in organization, then you become people-centered. You know, in my case in education, you become student-centered. And I think that as a result of that, you create this culture that surrounds that, that, that whole um, humanity. And I think, you know, when I was commissioner of education during COVID-19, um, um, during the pandemic, and sitting there with Governor Murphy, I talked about leading with humanity a lot. Understand this is different, this is new. 
So sometimes we have to give grace. And I think in leadership, um, at times, it becomes stressful. And you have to be able to lead the humanity and sometimes afford people grace. The other part of leadership, before you jump in, Mary, the other part of leadership that I know is deeply embedded in not just your philosophy, but who you are, mm -hmm. is that you are uh, a leader of a public school district in a highly urban community. Share with everyone where that was, where it is today. Mm -hmm. Asbury Park, uh, New Jersey. Asbury Park School District. That's right. And you told me and you told others, publicly and in private, that you expected more from those students than others expected from them. Nothing but their best. How much of leadership and how much of educational leadership, doctor, is predicated on high expectations of those, unfortunately, for whom too many people don't expect very much, and they're dead wrong about that? So it begins with excellence, right? You know, just a basic standard of excellence. And I think that when you raise the bar, you give people the ability to strive for something, to aspire to something. However, deficit thinking is when you look at things and say, that's the way it is. These are the circumstances. And you know what? I'm sorry. These kids, these people, this individual, this organization, this company, that's who, that's who we are. And so my job is to make sure to show them who we are and who we can be. Right to turn the the what impossible to impossible, and mm -hmm. I think that's always been my thing. Really, the level of standard of excellence, and what that means, and 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 showing them, and then when they start to see that success of the level of standard, they start to understand. Oh, it can be done, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, and that's that cultural mind shift we talked about. You know, Steve in the meeting in our office is to really that cultural mind shift, going from that fixed mindset to that growth mindset. And with those individuals, when they have this fixed mindset, it's always complacency. It's always mediocrity, right? But when you have this growth mindset, it becomes the impossible. What can you do? And I think it becomes that, you know, that, that vision. It becomes a dream and it becomes a dreamer. And I think just being visionary. And those folks who've been successful over a period of time have been dreamers, right? Been visionaries. Starting with Dr. King, who we talked about extensively. Yes, and definitely. You're talking about someone here. Uh, I'm saying right over your right shoulder. Yes, and, and today's beginning of Black History Month. So, of course, it's apropos that we talk about, you know, um, the contributions of Dr. King, right? And, you know, and Dr. King wasn't the only one during the civil rights, but he knew that the spotlight was on him. And he had a responsibility to do what is right. Mm -hmm. And he talked about love. And he, he, didn't, he didn't go with the approach of violence. He talked about nonviolence. His give a person a hug. Have a conversation with them. Understand, respect there's differences between one another, but find that common ground when it comes to equality, when it comes to equity, when it just comes to just basic civil rights and civil justice. And I think as we start to really look at ourselves, it starts with our moral compass. And I think Dr. King said it right with his moral compass. Sure did. And Mary, one of the reasons I wanted to do this with you as part of our Lessons in Leadership uh, series is that one of the themes in our work is that the status quo is never good enough. And Dr. Repolet is talking about that right now, regardless of what it is, whether it was worst case scenario, uh, the history of uh, racism, discrimination in our country. Dr. King believed the status quo was not good enough from an educational perspective. Um, um, Dr. Repolet saying in urban communities, not good enough. Mary, jump in. Yeah, and definitely speaking about status quo and innovation, which is just the complete opposite. Dr. Repolet, can you talk a little bit? I live in Union County. I drive by the Kane University billboards all the time talking about Kane University as New Jersey's first urban research institution. What does that mean for not only Union County, but for the entire state? That means that we're no longer just this, this university that sits within Union County. But we're a statewide entity, we're a national entity. And we're talking about this urban focus, right? And it's really looking at finding solutions to marginalized people in marginalized communities. And here we are, Kane University is a diverse university, one of the diverse, most diverse universities in the country. And so therefore you have a lot of our students that are from these urban centers. So just imagine you put a student in a situation where they're tasked to be able to come up with a solution where there's health disparities, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's housing, but looking through the lens of the college in which they, they're in, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's health, whether it's education. And see, to me, we talk about this, this urban agenda. Yes, we're very happy about this urban agenda because this urban agenda, it helps us, Steve, it helps us focus 
on our research, right? Because we can say New Jersey Research University. However, that's general, that's broad to where, what's our focus? We want everyone to understand that we're going to now pinpoint and be laser focused that's on right. the work we do within our colleges. They'll be focused on better in society, better in folks, better, better folks in their situation and finding solutions. So we're very pleased with this focus. And that's why it was important for us to be able to join forces and bring the Watson Institute of Public Policy and Research to Kane, because we knew that would give us the credibility in that area of urban research. Mm. Let me clarify um, and, and give more detail. The John S. Watson Institute for Urban Policy and Research at Kane University, uh, named after the great uh, honorable John S. Watson, Please check out our series, Remember Them. We remember um, his extraordinary work in the state legislature. I was proud to have served with him back in the day. He was the chair of the State Assembly Budget and Finance and Appropriations Committee. Uh, John S. Watson made a huge difference, the first person of color to lead that committee. And it's a one-on-one -on -one interview we did with Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman talking about her dad. But along those lines, we're also doing a series called Urban Matters in cooperation with the Institute. Urban Matters, about all the issues that Lamont, just, uh, Dr. Repolet just talked about. Real quick follow-up on this. Um, help us on this one. Um, you've led in a school district in an urban community. You've led at the Department of Education. You lead at Kane University. Is leadership just leadership, regardless of whether you're in a local government situation, state government, or university, or is there something different depending upon what field you're playing on? No, I agree. Leadership matters, right? Leadership, you know, and I tell people in simple terms. When you turn your head and you look back, if people are following you, you're a leader, right? However, if you turn your back, if you turn your head, no one's following you, not a leader. And so that means that whatever organization, small, mid, large, is that you're supposed to give them a vision. You're supposed to articulate where you're going to take them, right? And then you're supposed to have a mission set with goals and set with values of an organization. And I think no matter what size it is, if people truly understand that they know where they're going, right? They know how they're gonna get there and they know the outcomes when they get there, then guess what? They're more, the probability of them leading, following you is far greater. But if they don't, if you don't clarify your mission or your vision, and you look back, no one's following you because everyone is doing their own thing, right? Everyone is going out and about. So what it is, is really, I tell people, leadership in a nutshell is managing behaviors, right? How do you inspire individuals to do the work, right? How do you get them to do things that they don't see yet, but they have faith in you as a leader or faith in your organization that you know, if I go that way, I don't know what's on the other side, but if I do go that way, I have a belief that this individual, this organization is going to lead me in the right way. So it's really about belief. It's about faith. It's about leadership. It's about your vision. And if you don't cast the vision, you know, then how are people going to follow? If you don't give them a blueprint or mission to where to go, they're not going to follow. So for me, it does not matter what size, whether it's a classroom, whether it's state, local or private. I always I have this thing where I actually look at uh, companies, I look at their, their mission statements, I look at their vision statements, I look at their goals, because I want to find out exactly where we're going. So mm -hmm. when I have a nonprofit organization or any other group that meet with me, the first thing I say, okay, what goals do you have set for yourself? Because I want to know if you have a blueprint to where the outcomes is going to take us. So if I partner with you, am that's I going right. to get point? Yeah, and that's the essence of what Dr. King was all about, having a dream that communi he communicated effectively, inspired others to move toward that dream and put their lives on the line. And he ultimately sacrificed that 39 years of age, his life. Mary, last question, got a minute left. Yeah, definitely. I often ask uh, Dr. Repoled, uh, people in academia, what do our, because Steve and I both have uh, sons right now that are in college, what is the most important leadership trait, leadership or communication trait that our young adults need that are in college and going to be entering the workforce? If you look at the EQ of folks, right? You know, you look at people talk about IQ, but I really look at EQ, right? And you're looking at that, it's listening. I think sometimes we don't listen, you know, and, and, and if you listen, you can understand who you are. We don't reflect, we don't meditate. We don't take the time to find out who we are as individuals. Because other folks, I'm a parent with someone in college, I'm a parent right now with a daughter that's, that's a senior that's applying to colleges, 
right? And, and sometimes I, I tend not to listen to her because I'm not, I think I know what's best for her. But I left her alone a little bit. And let me tell you, I'm just surprised of the program she chose, the school she likes, whatever it is. So I think for students coming in right now, it's listening um, and really keeping your eyes open to, to things that, and get to know things that are different, right? Explore. And that's what I think is about exploration, listening. Uh, I think those are the big things as far as leadership, because they're going to develop those skills. They're going to develop soft skills along the way. And that's where there's general ed courses. What they do for you is kind of build those foundational skills. But I think one part is just listening. And I say, listen, listen to your heart. Sometimes our head kind of confuses us, right? But our heart kind of drives us. There's this book, I'm going to plug this book called The Alchemist by Paulo Polo. Is his little shepherd boy, right? Uh, to me, that's one of my favorite books. Love that book. Exactly. It's about follow your heart. And you never know, you can wind up bending gold in that way, right? Lamont Repolette, Dr. Lamont Repolette, the president of King University, a former commissioner of the Department of Education. Um, we're smarter because you joined us. Thank you, my friend. Well, thank you, Steve. I thank you very much for having me on here. I appreciate it. I look forward to um, you know talking more about you. And I really more if I see you for a giving day, okay? Okay. Yeah. Mary's an alum of Kane University. She's getting hit mm -hmm. up as she should yep. to contribute. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I'll be there. <laughs> but thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, guys. You guys stay with us. Mary and I have some final words right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com. NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Media, a print and digital business news network. Mary and I have a couple of minutes before we wrap up this edition of Lessons in Leadership. Mary, biggest takeaway from Dr. Repolette for you. It's so funny, and I know we've shared this in previous episodes. We tape a variety of segments on a given day, uh, to be exact, about 16 separate interviews. And most of our guests today have talked about the importance of listening. And that, to me, is such a major paradigm shift. I, Steve and I have been doing this now, Lessons in Leadership, first on audio, now on video. And just when we ask people the key to leadership... Not many people you bring up leadership. I mean, uh, listening. It's more so, oh, you need to communicate clearly. You need to be patient. You need to be empathetic. And so I don't know why the shift. I don't know if COVID has anything to do with it in terms of now people are just being more holistic about their approach to leadership. But I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Really, why listening so much today has resonated in the themes uh, from our guests. If I were to try in a few seconds to crystallize my response, I'd say this. We had our good friend, Michelle Sekirka, uh, recently you said, uh, the president of the Business and Industry Association of the States, she said, Steve, we need to be, quote, noise free and 23. And I think that's what it is. I think there's so much noise. You know, trust me, everybody got their phone, information coming at us a million different ways to listen. I mean, truly listen and be focused. I'm listening while Elvin is putting in the chat, say goodbye now, Steve. I'm listening to him. Be present. Easier said than done with all the other distractions. Let's just listen a little bit harder um, because the people around us sometimes have important things to say. See you next time. Lessons in Leadership. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Media, a print and digital business news network.